Good morning. Morning and welcome here to Berwick Church. Welcome to all of us, whether we're here regularly or we're here for one of the first times. Those who are watching and listening to, we welcome you. A couple of things to mention before we um, begin. First is, um, I'm on holiday from tomorrow for a week. And so next week, um, Jim is going to be leading us in worship. Um, so I'll be on holiday next week. So if you phone me, email me from 10 o'clock tonight, I will not be answering until I come back home. Thank you very much to those who are helping or supporting in any way um, the thrift shop, the kind of jumbo sale that we had next door throughout most of this week. Whether you donated or you came along and bought some things, thank you very much. Um, the total, which is more than we were expecting, was £788. Um, so thank you very much um, to all of you. Indeed. Um, and to those who are serving, in particular to Margaret Gray, um, who is uh, organising it all, thank you to all of you um, for doing that. It all goes towards church funds. Um, and so we're very grateful for that. Also to say that, um, as, on, as is on the screen, on the 2nd of June, in a couple of weeks' time, on Friday at half past seven, our organist at Abuthnut is having an organ recital there. That's open to everyone, whether you're part of the church family or you're, you've never been to church in your life, and you're very welcome to that. So it's in the evening on the 2nd of June at half past seven at Abuthnut Church. Again, um, funds going towards... Uh, the church but it's open welcome and you don't have to give if you don't wish to and um, but i know it'll be a, a fun evening for all and also is this tonight uh, it's tonight um margaret is it just you it's part of the church that's involved in this are you involved in this the elijah thing oh, yes, yes so, so, so margaret who's uh, part of our um team who leads us in praise um is involved in the stone even chorus um group and they've got uh music event tonight called Elijah um, happening in Stonehaven Town Hall at half past seven. You're very welcome to that. See, tickets are £15. So speak to Margaret afterwards if you want to know more information about that. Now one last thing is that when I come back in a couple of weeks time on the 11th of uh, June will be um, communion. But as part of that communion service it's going to be a bit different. Not only will it be communion which is we don't do it every week but also as part of that service we need something that we don't do and have not done for three years and that is um, bring on board three new people who are going to be part of our leadership team which are called the Kirk Session or the elders within our church and those people are um, Alison, Alison Aitchison who's at the front here and um, Peter who's in the middle and just flown back from the Philippines um, when did you get back? 10 o'clock today from the Philippines um, we left yesterday and that's dedication and Sandra who's sitting over here as well as somebody called Elaine White who worships with us at Abuthnut. And all four of them, the Kirk Session, have been um, looking at folk who could be part of our leadership team and have decided that these four are um, worthy of being part of um, our leadership team. But there's a wee thing that basically to ask, because we're part of a church together, that if you've got any reason why they shouldn't be part of our leadership team, then you've got to let me know um, as soon as possible. So send me an email um, this week or you can send me a text and I'll answer it when I'm back. If you've got any reason, in terms of their life or doctrine that they shouldn't be an elder, part of a leadership team, then let me know. So if they're worshipping a different God, if they're doing stuff that you think they should not be part of the Christian leadership team, let me know. And if nothing comes up, then on the 11th of June, we'll be ordaining them to eldership. I think that's all. Let me read some words from Paul as he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul says this about Jesus. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that in his poverty you might become rich. In other words, Jesus gave up heaven to come to the dirt of earth. Jesus gave up his throne to come to be a servant. Jesus gave up everything that you might have everything. And so it's that God, that wonderful God that we worship as we sing our opening praise. King of heaven, and restore, O Lord, if we're able, we'll stand to sing for both. Jesus, let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done.
Come to God in prayer. Almighty God, everlasting Father, yours is the glory, yours is the power. God, we thank you that you draw us here today in your mercy as your people. We thank you that when we were in darkness, you have revealed your light. We're amazed that while we were yet sinners, you sent Jesus to come and die for us. Father God, we thank you that you draw us from the youngest to the oldest, from those who've known you for generations or part of a family for generations, and those whose families and whose lives have never come to know you until we have. Lord, thank you that you welcome all of us, the young and the old, the rich and the poor, whatever skin tone we might have, whatever background we have, you welcome us all. But Lord, you long to change our lives. You long to make us more like Jesus, that we might have life to the full. So we ask that you speak to our hearts, we pray. Point out anything within us that's not of you. Lord, convict us of every lie and every selfish action, every judgmental attitude, every critical spirit, and all manner of things that separate us from you. Lord, we don't deserve your love, but in your mercy, you love us nonetheless. And you forgive us day after day. So we thank you for the promise in Jesus. That our sin is removed as far as the east is from the west. That you remember our sin no more because of Jesus. So let our hearts burst into praise. Let joy be the song of our hearts. For God has forgiven us. He's made us new. We're part of his family. What grace, what love, what joy is ours. For we come as your people to celebrate and to make much of you. And we gather as your people to pray the words that Jesus taught us to say. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. This one on what is? Thank you. Right, boys and girls, how are we today? Are we good? Yeah. Now I want to ask you quickly: What's been a good thing you've done this week? What's been a, some something fun you've done this week? What have you done that's fun this week? Anyone done anything fun? What have, what have you done that's fun this week? What's been a you planted some strawberries. Oh, I like strawberries. Oh, have you got something? Yeah. What did you do? It was fun this week. I I had a movie night. You had a movie night, and who did you have a movie night with? Mum. Mummy. And what did you watch? Can you remember what it's called? We, we had Jack, Captain Jack Sparrow. Oh, it was it Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. Wow, I like Pirates too. That's a good film. Did you, did you have lots of snacks? 
Yeah, yeah, good. That sounds lots of fun. Asha, what did you do that's fun this week? Did you go on your bike? Yeah, we saw, Asha and I took, took Asha on his bike the other day and I saw about half of you while I was out a walk with Asha. Oh, do you want, oh, do you know what have you got? What did you do that's fun this week? Oh, you had a, oh, you had a birthday. How old are you? 15? 46? Only three, oh, oh, well done. Well, happy birthday to you. You want one more thing? Right, what have you got, Sandra? What would you do that's fun this week? I had such an amazing week, you're speechless. I have my Batman t-shirt now. Oh, you've got a new t-shirt, lovely. Well, wow, that's wonderful, fantastic. Now, I want to show you something. Can you, does anyone know what this is? I'm not going to pause Paw Patrol, but do you know what it's called? Or what, what you do with it? Yeah, what do you do with it? You draw it, and then once you draw it, it's like a bit of paper where the, the paint, the, it's stuck there forever? Or what can you do with it? You, you rub it by doing this. You can rub it out. So this is Asher's, and Asher, as per usual, wants to have whatever somebody else has got. Um, can you watch me? So I'm going to try and tell you a story while holding the microphone. Okay, so we're going to tell you a little story of what... Um, Everyone else is going to be looking at a little bit later on in here. So, later on, um, when you talk about next door, we're going to meet a man called Zacchaeus. Can you spell Zacchaeus, do you think? Is that a big long word? So, we've got a bit of a long word. So, what we'll do is we'll just write Zach. So, we're going to meet a man called Zach. Now, Zach was not a nice man. Zach was a pretty horrible man. Because God had told him, like he tells all of us, that you've got to love. And he's told Zacchaeus, you have got to, what's the symbol for love? What do you draw if you're doing love? A love heart. So God had told him, if I can do one upside down, you've got to love me and find joy and life in me. And also you've got to love everyone else. You've got to love people. But Zacchaeus didn't love people and he didn't love God. Instead, he loved himself and he loved his money. He thought that's the most important thing in the world, not people, but money. So one day Jesus was coming to town and Zacchaeus thought, I want to go and meet this Jesus. But Zacchaeus was quite a small man and everyone else was really, really tall. And he couldn't see Jesus because Zacchaeus is a little boy, a little, little person, but everyone else was like big giants to him. Now, what would you do if you wanted to see someone really, really tall or wanted to see something that you couldn't see? Would you stand in something or climb something? What do you get outside that has things growing on it that's quite tall? What's a tall plant in your garden, maybe? What's the tallest plant in your garden? And it might have leaves on it. Yeah. Oh, biggest flower ever. It's not a flower, but I'm looking for something else. We can say teh. Oh, yep. A tree. And so there's a tree nearby, and Zacchaeus said, I'm going to go and climb that tree. And so he went and he climbed the big tree, and he went up the tree. And he met with Jesus. And Jesus told him, You've got to love people, you've got to love God. I'm going to change your life. I love you, even though everyone else doesn't like you. I love you. And do you know what happened? Zacchaeus' life was transformed. And he said, I love not money. Not myself, but I love God and I love people now. And so Zacchaeus had lots of money and he said, I'm going to give all of my money away. And he started finding people who needed money and he says, I want to give to you. I want to look out for you. I want to love you because I know that God loves me even when I mess up, even when I'm not nice. God still loves me and he wants to make me and give me a new heart. And that's the reason that I brought this because as you said at the beginning, it rubs it out. And so Zacchaeus had a bad heart. A not very nice heart. But God says, no, I'm going to rub that old heart out. And instead, I'm going to give you a brand new heart. A heart full of love for people. And Jesus wants to do that with you. He wants to give all of us brand new hearts. Not our old heart, but a new one that loves people, that loves God, and has full of joy and life. And that's good news for us. Right, I'm going to pray. And then I think we're going to sing again. What song are we singing? Jesus, my Savior. We'll sing, we'll pray, and then we shall sing. Let's pray. 
Loving God, we thank you that you are a God filled with love for each and every one of us. That no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, you still love us. Thank you that you loved Zach. Thank you that you love each and every one of us. Even when we mess up, even when we are not very nice, you still want to forgive us and love us. Lord God, I thank you for these boys and girls here. I thank you for them, for their families. I thank you that you join us week after week. Might you bless them and encourage them. And might you fill them with a new heart too. A love filled for you and a love for other people. Lord, bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Wonderful. We're going to sing together. Jesus. going to lead us in prayer, then Paul's going to read our scriptures from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. Good morning, everybody. Let's lift our hearts to God in prayer. I want to pray thanks to God for the blessing of the thrift shop. Everything that the church does contributes in some way to the glory of God's name. 
And I pray that the ripples from that activity, the efforts of the volunteers, the goodness of the hearts of those who gave should flood out and make a difference for our community and uplift us as the people who made that contribution that we should all feel that we have done the good thing and we should be able to take that forward with us into our community this week, every week, in all our interactions. Feel good about what we've done. In your name, Lord, through your strength. I pray for the members who will get together at lunchtime today that they should experience wonderful fellowship and again go out into the community uplifted. But we need to remember too, those who can't attend, that they should feel included, that that fellowship should still be reaching out to them, holding them, so they feel your love as well, Lord, so they know you are with them, even if they can't be with us today. It's joyous to know that new people are being called to lead our church and support it in its work. And I pray for your support for them, for the work that Andrew and Kirsty are doing, and their family, and that all the volunteers, those who are prominent and well-known and seen, and those who are working in the background to support you, and those who are praying every day for this church, and for its success. I pray for all of them. Let's hold them in our hearts. I pray that you strengthen them and you bring our revival, our much-awaited revival, Lord. As we look out into Burvey and we see your community, give us the heart to notice the eyes to see and the ears to hear where you are needed, where you are wanted, and where those who need to know about you but don't yet. Help us to reach them and help them to reach us. Through your strength, this will happen, Lord. We trust. Bless our town. Bless our area, bless our country. Lift our hearts and the hearts of those around us. So many are in need. Only you know, only you know, Lord, what their needs are. Provide for them. As our church meets in Edinburgh at the assembly. Help all those who attend to make good decisions. Support them. Give them energy and wisdom so that they might renew their strength in meeting and by doing so they might revive our church. Lift us and power us forward to do your work, Lord. Around the world, our church, brothers and sisters, look to you for support in the face of persecution. Lord, change the hearts of those who are persecuting our church. You can do this. We saw this with Pharaoh. We know you can do it. We trust in you to do this work. That persecution should end and your church should shine in every community, everywhere in the world. Freedom of practice, freedom of worship. Lord, we pray for our country and our world. Bring peace all over the world, in those conflicts that we hear about in the news every day and in those conflicts which don't get that profile but cause us much suffering. Uphold the rights of each human being made in your image, Lord. Grant them the refuge they need. Bring them the essentials that we so often take for granted.
Lord, please inspire your leaders to walk in your path, to do right all around the world. We trust in you. We know you have a plan, a plan to prosper us. And we wait in patience and in faith. Amen. The Bible reading is from Luke, from the beginning of chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho. He wasn't really going there, he was just passing through. And a man was there, his name was Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector. And boy, he was rich. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being vertically challenged, he wasn't able to see over the heads of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him because Jesus was heading that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm going to stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter the way people do. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. How would he go to somebody like that? But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay him back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, Paul. I think we've all had a moment in life that will be forever lodged in our brain. A moment where you knew because of that event or that circumstance or that thing that's just happened, your life would never be the same. What you knew beforehand has gone out the window. It's like a light has been switched on. Everything was brand new. Maybe when I say that, some of you are thinking, oh, it's when my child was born. Until that moment, I was immature. I didn't have responsibilities. But as soon as that child was born, everything changed. I had to grow up. I had to become a mum, a dad for the first time. Perhaps it's a book that you read or a documentary you watched where um, the thing that's presented there would go on to change you. It would impact the way you view the world and view how you lived your life. Maybe an experience you went through made you see things differently, made you act differently. I know folk who, um, after they've had a car crash, are suddenly the world's safest drivers because they're like, I am never letting that happen again. That event they went through changed life forever. Or perhaps it was simply just meeting somebody who introduced you to a new way of life. Well, that's exactly what happened with Zacchaeus. As we just read, as Paul read for us, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. It's the final journey of Jesus. He's on his way to the events of Easter week. Later on in chapter 19, we read the beginning of it, the events of Palm Sunday happen. 
But Jesus has not quite finished his job, his mission, his ministry. He's got one more person to meet. And so the crowds begin to gather at Jericho, a few miles um, away from Jerusalem. The miracle man, Jesus, is in town. There's a buzz, there's excitement in the air. For three years, people have heard all about this miracle man, Jesus, the amazing teacher who claims he is God. Some have probably witnessed his miracles. In fact, many of them would have. Just before this event, at the end of chapter 18, we meet a man who's a beggar called Bartimaeus, who is blind, but Jesus gives sight to. And this happens at the other side of Jericho. Jesus walks into the city, Bartimaeus is suddenly given sight, then he enters into the city, and everyone crowds around him. Zacchaeus is one of these folk in the crowd. He's got two problems. The first, he's pretty short. But the crowds were big and buzzing and he was never going to be able to get through and see Jesus. And the second is this, he was a tax collector. He had ripped people off, he had no friends who would open up a gap and say, Zacchaeus, in you come, you can go in front and look at Jesus and see him. There's a well-known children's song, we're not singing it today, called Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. Indeed he was, not just short physically, but also he was wee and little spiritually. He's a crook that ripped people off, who pocketed the profits at their expense. But with Zacchaeus, there was a keenness to meet with Jesus. I want to meet this man. I've heard the lives he's transformed. Maybe he can do something with mine. Now, why did Zacchaeus want to meet with Jesus? We don't know. We can only speculate. But I wonder if it's because Zacchaeus had heard the stories of who Jesus hung out with. Maybe he'd heard a story of how one of the followers of Jesus, disciples, a man named Matthew, used to have the same job as him. He also used to be a tax collector. Or maybe he'd heard the stories of Jesus hanging out with people who were tax collectors and having meals with them and spending time with them and caring for them. His compassion and his kindness knew no boundaries. As we see in verse 7, tax collectors were seen with a particular disdain in those days. Now, in every culture, tax collectors are not popular people. But in those days, they were even more hated. In the time of the New Testament, they were hated not by um, the outside world, but by their own people. For they represented the foreign domination of Rome. So the Roman government would ask people like Zacchaeus, can you collect taxes from your fellow man and fellow woman? When they trade, when they buy stuff, when they sell stuff, when they pass through your city, take a small percentage of their earnings. And Zacchaeus and others would have taken, let's say, that 1% they were asked to collect. But also he would say, I'm keeping an extra couple of percent for myself. And so Zacchaeus and others often overcharged. They often pocketed the surplus, handing over what they had to back to Rome. Zacchaeus was a rich man because he stole and indeed, in the writings of that time, they were often classed as their job as a thief. Some were carpenters, some were builders, some were farmers, tax collectors. They were thieves. That was their job. And in the Gospels, the phrase tax collectors and sinners comes up time and time again. In other words, tax collectors were seen as the lowest of the low, along with folk like prostitutes and others whose society hated at the time. Tax collectors were as bad and as an outcast like them. But Jesus hangs out with people like tax collectors and sinners time and time again. They were the renegades who Jesus loved. Jesus came along to love even them. So Zacchaeus wants to meet with Jesus. He does the unthinkable, at least in his culture, and he climbs a tree. Now, even in our modern day culture, adults do not climb trees. It was strange for anyone older than maybe 12 or 13 to be climbing a tree. If you saw saw someone up a tree, you'd probably have a a chuckle at that. You'd say, that's a bit weird. If you saw a kid doing it, you'd say, that's normal behavior for a child. But Zacchaeus is probably thinking, already I'm hated. No one likes me. I'm an outcast. What have I got to lose? I'm climbing that tree, even if they all laugh at me. I want to meet with Jesus. Jesus says, have faith like a child and you will see the kingdom of God. You will understand what it is to be a child of God. Zacchaeus climbs a tree like a child and unbeknown to him, he was going to see the kingdom of God in his life. I wish there were more of us who were like Zacchaeus, 
willing to do whatever possible, even if it cost us to be ridiculed and mocked, if only it would help us to see more of Jesus. So Jesus walks along. He looks up and he sees a man in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, let's go for lunch. I'm coming to your house for lunch. I must come to your house for lunch. Now I wonder how he said Zacchaeus' name. Because you should have one thing. It wasn't like anyone else had spoken to Zacchaeus in recent years. Zacchaeus' name would only have been used with disgust or paired with a swear word in recent years. Oh, not that swear word, Zacchaeus, come to take my money again. That's all he would have ever heard his name being used like. But Jesus would have used it with love. Maybe the last time Zacchaeus heard his name used with love was from the lips of his, of his mother. Jesus says, I must stay for lunch. It's part of my mission, part of my plan from God. I must come to your house. And Jesus wants to do that with your life too. Come and meet with you and transform your life. But are you up for welcoming him? Are you up for getting up the tree in your own way and saying, Jesus, I want to meet with you. I want to welcome you. Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus. He didn't recite a creed. He didn't believe a doctrine. He didn't perform a ceremony. He said, Jesus, I welcome you into my life. And we all are encouraged to do that today. Maybe you're here today because Jesus wants to meet with you. Maybe you feel like Zacchaeus. I don't belong. I'm not like the rest. Jesus says, I want to be in your life. Maybe you have had things done to you or you've done things to others that make you believe God would have no time for me. Jesus says, no, I want to spend time with you. I want to change your life. I care about you. Jesus wants to take your brokenness and transform it into love. He wants to give you a fresh start give you life when there was death, give you hope when there was sorrow. And that's what happens with him, with Zacchaeus. He welcomes Jesus and his life is transformed. Now in the middle of that chapter between verses um, 6, when he welcomes Jesus gladly, in verse 8 when Zacchaeus um, speaks again, we don't know what happens in terms of what they had for dinner or what they um, said to each other. But just like you can't see the wind but you can see its effects. You can't hear or see what Jesus said to Zacchaeus, but you know it must have been something because you can see the effects of what happened. Zacchaeus was transformed in verse 8. The people had spent time grumbling about Zacchaeus and Jesus hanging out together. What a waste of space! Why would Jesus hang out with that guy? Instead, they should have been rejoicing. Look at that love that God has for people like Zacchaeus. Everyone else hates them. God loves them. He can love even people like that. And so it's good news for you and good news for me. Whatever you've done, whoever you are, you are not too far from God. You can welcome Jesus and Jesus wants to transform your life. Look at what happens to Zacchaeus. He goes from thief to philanthropist. He says in verse 8, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. He receives Jesus, welcomes him into his life. His life is transformed. He was never going to be the same man. How could he? God had spent lunch with him. The Lord of heaven and earth had left his throne and come and spent time in the house of Zacchaeus. He was hated by his contemporaries, but he knew God loved him. He had sinned and defrauded, and yet God was forgiving him. He was inferior to everyone else, but now God says, you're worthy of my rescue. He was blind, but now he saw. And so his life is transformed. He repents. He turns back in his old ways. And he goes to fix the mess he'd made. Now, the law at that time said, when you defraud someone and you're caught, you pay them back, but you give them 20% more. It was was basically a, a fine. So you steal 100 pounds, you give that person back 120 um, pounds. So that was the law, one-fifth more. But Zacchaeus doesn't say, fine, I'll pay back that amount. I'll pay back four times the amount. I stole 100, I give you back 400. He was doing far more than was necessary. And considering the way he made his money, stealing all the time, that list would have been a very long list. A very long list indeed. And the amazing thing is, the wording gives a hint to it here, but even more clear in the original Greek. 
is that Chias is kind of says, right at this moment as I speak, I am giving money back to people. I'm helping the poor. It's almost like he comes out of his house and he says to Jesus, Jesus, here and now, as I speak to you, I, oh, Joseph, here's the money I owe you. As he speaks to Jesus, he's putting his hand in his pocket and his money bag and giving it back to Joseph and to Elizabeth and to everyone else who he'd stole money from as he speaks. It wasn't like a promise like, when I get round to it, I'll give money back. When you've gone, Jesus, right now my life has changed and I give it away. He also gives half of his money to the poor. Minutes earlier, he was stealing from the poor. Now he gives it to serve the poor because the king and lord of all had changed his life. You might be skeptical going, life can't transform that quickly. Of course it can. Life can be changed by Jesus very easily. No one is too far from God. No one is too deep in sin to be rescued. Now that's a long ago story. Let me give you one that happened two weeks ago. I read about a convention, a big gathering in Boston in the USA. Now, it wasn't like many conventions to do with technology or changing the world in terms of environmental issues or anything like that. The convention was for a bunch of folk who were, satan- who were Satanists. It was the world's largest ever Satanic convention. The convention began with the leader of this couple of thousand strong crowd getting a Bible, ripping pages out of it and saying, Hail Satan. That's how it began and then they all did various satanic type things and and mocked other um, faiths and religions. But at the same time, outside of that, a bunch of Christians were praying for people and telling people, don't follow Satan, follow Jesus, he wants to transform your life. And one, two, three, people kept on coming to Jesus. By the end, after a couple of days of the convention, over 100 people had given their life to Jesus. They'd went in there going, I hate Jesus, I want nothing to do with him, I love the fact that we rip up the Bibles. They went home worshipping Jesus. Jesus changes lives. And just like that with Zacchaeus. And one of the ways that we see transformation happening is through our reaction, through our attitude towards money and things and possessions. Why? Because the grip that we have of money and finance on our life becomes less when Jesus becomes our treasure. In the chapter before, in chapter 18, we meet another rich man. He's called the rich young ruler in the middle of chapter 18. And this man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what can I do to get to heaven? How can I be sure I will get to heaven? Jesus reminds him, have you done the religious type stuff? And he says, yeah, I go to church, I read my Bible, I I know all the hymns, I even serve on five committees at the local church. I've got it all done. I'm top notch. But Jesus says, fine. You still lack one thing, though. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you will have an unimaginable treasure in heaven and come follow me. Mark writes the same story and he tells us a man goes away downheartened, and saddened. He knows I cannot serve both God and money. And so he walks away sorrowful because the cost of following Jesus was too high. The cost of everlasting life, the cost of heaven was meaning I need to give up my money. I need to not let that be the thing that consumes all of my life. But with Zacchaeus, another rich man, it was different. He encounters Jesus and he says, I cannot serve God and money. But this time he says, I give it all away because knowing God and his love for me is worth it. He gives away half his wealth to the poor. He pays back his victims. And after all of that, I bet he was one of the poorest folk in the community. The cost of not following Jesus, of not being one of his people, was far too high. Two rich people encounter Jesus. One is unwilling to lose his money. The other unwilling to keep them. What makes a difference? what they treasured most. One treasures money, the other treasured God. Jesus says, count the cost of following after me. You might lose some of your finances. You might lose your status. You might give up some of your energy or effort to follow me. But Jesus says, but be careful. What's the cost of not following me? He says, for what will it profit someone if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul? 
In other words, what's the point of being as rich as Zacchaeus if you don't have everlasting life and joy in God? And it's not that giving money away means you go to heaven. Because Jesus and Jesus alone is the only way to heaven. You can be poor and be a follower of Jesus and go to heaven. You can be rich and go to heaven. But the thing is, if we choose Jesus, the money, the possessions, the comfort that we have in our life seems so much less important. Zacchaeus understood this. I've got Jesus now. What do I need money for? When I've got the love of God in my life, what use is all this wealth? I'm the richest guy ever. I'm forgiven. I'm blessed. I'm made new. I've got everything I could ever want. Not the money. Not my wealth. Not my comfort. I've got Jesus. A man named Tim Keller, who died a couple of days ago, a pastor in America, said this. The gospel, the good news is this. We are more sinful and flawed than in ourselves than we ever dared believe. But yet, at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. And that was the truth for Zacchaeus. I've messed up. I've messed up big time. God should hate me that I steal and I'm corrupt, but I'm loved. I am loved. He found that his sins were forgiven, that God could be his friend. He knew that grace was sufficient for every need of his. He knew the joy, the comfort, and the strength of being part of God's family forever. The rich young ruler said, I hear all that, but I want my money. Zacchaeus says, I had all of that money. I don't want it now. I want what God can give to me. Zacchaeus chose the richest, the riches. Incomparable, incomprehensible, utterly breathtaking riches. The rich young ruler with his thousands of bank accounts and investments and bank vaults says, I choose poverty. I choose complete destitution and I become the most pitiful man in all of history. He could have had his sins forgiven. He could have had unspeakable joy. He could have had everlasting hope. He could have known love and the power of God in his life and yet he says, no, what a waste. He chose money and wealth. So the question is, what do we treasure most? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, says Jesus. What captures your heart you will say, I will not leave that. So I wonder what captures your heart. Maybe like today you come with the attitude of Zacchaeus or the rich man who says, money is my treasure, comfort is my hope, possessions is where I find my security. But do you choose them and in turn choose spiritual and eternal poverty? Or do you choose unimaginable riches and treasure like Zacchaeus? For when we treasure Jesus as bigger and greater than all, God molds us into a different person. He makes us like Zacchaeus, generous and loving and kind and willing to part because the money in our pockets is no use anymore. The more we find the joy of who Jesus is and what he's done, the grip on our money will be looser. Now, I'm not saying that God's out to make you poor. As I say, rich people, plenty of rich people who go to heaven, plenty of poor people go to heaven. The aim of God is not to make you poor. The aim is that you would find your delight not in your money, not in your possessions, not in your comfort, but that Jesus and his love would be your all. For so often we are like magpies. Oh, a shiny brand new car. Or a shiny lovely holiday. Look at that lovely number on my bank account. Look at the comfort. Look at the possessions I have. But then they disappear. I know folk I've mentioned before, I've known who've, who were very rich, put their money in the wrong investment, and they became very poor. If you base your um, comfort on your looks, I'm sorry to say, your looks will fade. If you base it on your health, I'm sorry to say, your health will fade. If you base it on your job one day, you will grow old, you will retire, you will no longer be in that job. If you base it on your family, your friends, I hope not, but they might give up on you. They might leave you. The new car, as happened to me, after three weeks of owning our car, you bump it and you scrape it. Or your holiday, well, I'm in one tomorrow, but it lasts a week and then we're done, back to work. Designer clothing, it will rip, it will fall apart. Your accessories, you will lose them. Or in my case, your child will break them. All of that stuff, gone. But God is a stronghold. He is a strength. He is a mountain that will never fade. 
when Jesus becomes better than all the world can give to you, your life is transformed. God is not after your wallet or your bank account. He's after your heart. Our hearts are drawn to the idols of money and wealth, but Jesus says, give me your heart. Let me take you on adventures that you cannot begin to conceive. Let me transform your heart from the inside out, giving you a new one. Might you realize how utterly bankrupt your money is? The utter eternal bankruptcy it is if you cling to that as your everlasting hope. So ask yourself, how much like Zacchaeus am I when we first meet him? Am I stingy by nature? Concerned about wealth and possessions more than the joy that God can give to me? How much more like Zacchaeus should we be as he becomes? Amazed at the love of God, overjoyed at the richness of the salvation in Jesus, prompting us to be generous and willing to part for the sake of others. John Wesley, brother of Charles Wesley, who wrote lots of hymns, says, the last part of a person to be converted is their wallet. I think there's something true in that. We can give up everything else. I'll stop swearing. I'll stop drinking so much. I'll stop doing this, that, and the other thing. My life will be transformed. But God, my money is mine. But will you let Jesus convert your heart and in turn your wallet? Not because God wants your wallet, but because God wants your heart, all of your heart. Will you lose your life for the sake of Jesus and find in him joy uncomparable, riches untold? Let's worship the generous God. Let's rejoice in the riches of God that he gives to his people. Let us live a generous life. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the good news is that you, though being rich, you became poor for us. Thank you that you give up the throne of heaven, the richness of heaven to come and spend time with us. You come not to be a king on earth, but you come to be a servant of all. Lord, we pray that we would be a generous people in response. That we would recognize the strength and the, the security we find is not in our money, in our possessions, or in our comforts, but rather it can be in you. Lord, give us a new heart, we pray. Let, let us be like Zacchaeus. Well, let us welcome you. And in welcoming you, let our lives be transformed by you. That our hearts can be made new once again. That we can be the people you call us to be to be generous in response to a generous God. Bless us in all of this, we ask, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where's my phone? Um, Okay, we're going to sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is Rejoice, the Lord is King.
may you rejoice for the generosity of God has been poured out into your life. And may you be richly blessed from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit today and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Just a couple of things I forgot to mention earlier. I want to mention. First, as Jane mentioned it um, a little bit in prayer, but we've been saying the last couple of weeks, um, folk about going to homes for lunch today, thanks to those who are hosting and to those who are going. Um, Margaret Benton says that she's got a couple of spaces left at her home and she's made a big vat of soup and she can't eat it all herself. So if you'd like to go to Margaret's home for lunch, you can go straight after worship today. Margaret and Peter will show you um, where to go and Peter can tell you all about his trip to the Philippines if you want as well. So that open an invite, um, that warm invite is open to all of you. You don't have to pay, just go and spend some time with Margaret and Peter today. Another thing I want to say is just um, quickly in terms of that hope we're talking about, where is your hope lying? I mentioned a quote by Timothy Keller, who said passed away a couple of days ago. Timothy Keller is a well-known um, preacher and pastor and author from America. He died of pancreatic cancer um, just a day or so ago. And the day before he died, his son put on, on the internet a quote from his dad. He knew his time was coming. He was going home for hospice care. And this is what he says in prayer a couple of days before he passed away. I'm thankful for all the people who've prayed for me over the years. I'm thankful for my family who loves me. I'm thankful for the time that God has given me. But I'm ready to see Jesus. I can't wait to see Jesus. Send me home. His hope was not in his job. He planted hundreds of churches. He'd written lots of books and was well known. It was not in that. His hope was in Jesus. And he says, I'm looking forward to being home. And that's where he is. Might that hope be yours today. God bless.